Hi there, my name is Emily Gorsensky from ThoughtWorks. I'm going to be talking to you today about a better SLO for data intensive systems. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present a few different SLOs that you might use to improve your data intensive systems, such as BI systems, data pipelines, or machine learning systems. So I'll begin today by talking about the value of reliability. And this is something that if you work in the SRE space, you must be keenly aware of. But me as a data scientist, as a data engineer, I often see a lot of people struggling with having a perspective on reliability that allows them to engineer better systems. We all know that data engineers are spending a lot of time firefighting. We all know that data scientists are often very grumpy about their data quality, about the amount of work that they have to do in order to build their very cool AI systems. So what I wanna do is I wanna to try to bring a better frame for why we should care about reliability as a first class concern, rather than thinking about reliability as an afterthought or something that is somebody else's problem. One of the things that we often see uh, as a consultant is a lot of anti-patterns or sort of emergent behaviors in data engineering teams. And these types of patterns kind of repeat themselves regardless of the type of organization, whether it's a, a fast growing startup or scale up, or if it's a large enterprise organization. And these types of patterns kind of um, have a, a similar set of flavors. And maybe if you've worked in data, some of these things are, are familiar to you, right? Things like data engineers spending a massive percentage of their time doing ad hoc ticket requests or solving this sort of quote unquote data pull problem. Data engineers are constantly doing things like backfills or managing schema changes. Um, data scientists are running studies or experiments, but they're not necessarily able to reproduce them, or you spend a lot of time doing machine learning POC development, but you actually don't move anything into production. So all of these things are sort of early warning signs for something that is going to become more painful uh, for you in the future. This sort of proliferation of the shadow data infrastructure um, is the typical way that we address a lot of these reliability problems. And that's not necessarily the best thing for us to do. Data reliability is important because we need to think about who our stakeholders are when we're working with data. Data teams are often reporting to people like the CFO. They're reporting to, or, or they're creating reports for things like financial reporting through their uh, massive analytics clusters. Uh, they're launching marketing campaigns based on, on their insights. These things are very, very important, and it's a different user than another sort of technical team, which we might have if we're building um, an infrastructure for uh, cloud software develop, uh, application development, or if we're building, say, an API that has to interface as middleware between other APIs. There's this great quote that I have here, um, developers and IT ops professionals had separate and often competing objectives, separate department leadership, separate key performance indicators by which they were judged, and often worked on separate floors or even separate buildings. The result was siloed teams concerned only with their own fiefdoms, long hours, botched releases, and unhappy customers. And this quote goes back to the sort of condition that we were in in the ops space before we brought in agile software development, continuous de uh, delivery principles, and DevOps principles into software development. But if you just kind of look at that statement and you think of, a, of that through the edge of data science, data engineering, uh, data analysis, or BI analytics, the situation's actually the same. And so what we actually wanna do is we wanna to try to bring DevOps mindset into the data space. We wanna to try to bring SRE mindset into the data space. And of course that means bringing in SLOs. The reality is that data analytics and AI, it's in a rough shape from a technical perspective. Quotes that I hear all the time is it takes four to six weeks to develop an insight or I spend 80% of my time cleaning data this sort of constant firefighting, the long time to production, long cycle times. Um, when systems go down, when data systems go down, they sometimes take days to get back up and that's really not an acceptable place for us to be in. We tend to deprioritize it because it doesn't stop the operational side of the business. If your production database for your, um, for your web shop goes down, you fix that as quickly as possible. But if the analysts are grumpy, well, the, the analysts, Analysis can usually wait a day or two for things to be fixed. That's not a great situation for us to be in. So most of the organizations that have tried to solve these problems, often through building newer and bigger and different types of data platforms, have really embraced the SLA concept. Um, SLAs, of course, are service level agreements. And this is sort of a, an 
this this concept goes back uh, several decades. In fact, I was talking with Alex Hidalgo uh, a couple of weeks ago. He wrote the fantastic uh, book Introducing SLOs, um, and he said the first experience that, or the first uh, evidence he had of the term SLA or service level agreement goes back to the 1920s. But the thing about SLAs is that we often don't really understand them or we're using them in the wrong way. SLAs are supposed to be contracts between parties that specify what to do if things go wrong. So if you miss your service level agreement, then you are obligated to provide some sort of discount. When we're talking about internal teams, SLAs can make sense, but it actually doesn't really drive us towards better behavior. It just sort of acts as um, a, a control mechanism for how teams should perform. It doesn't necessarily act as a guidance mechanism for how teams could perform. The second thing about SLAs is that when we think about operational systems, for example, microservices, we think of data as a hot potato, right? If you're building like a microservice application, the data comes in, you want to touch it for as little time as possible, and then the data goes out as fast as it can with as few changes as possible. The value of the service doesn't come from the quantity or the size or the richness of the data. It comes from being able to do the same thing over and over and over at scale. So the, it's a low marginal value per transaction. Whereas in analytical systems, for example, BI systems, we have a much higher marginal value per transaction. One insight, one report can be worth millions of dollars. If you notice a trend in your sales behavior, your product performance, your say your, your logistics, your shipping SLAs with your logistics providers, that could be worth hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. And you're going to look at that report probably once or twice a month at best. That puts a much higher burden on reliability for these types of systems. You don't need to, uh, you don't drive the value for the system through a lot of transactions. You drive the value of the system through the quality of the transactions. That's a much different situation. SLAs tend to be around minimizing failures and fixing bugs not around designing a better user experience. So when we want to think about SLOs, we should be thinking about some things like how to connect objectives, service level objectives, to user value. In this case of data systems, those users are often internal users who need the data in order to do their job. SLOs should give us a little bit of wiggle room to allow for experimentation. That's an informal way of saying something like an error budget. They should improve or inform engineering improvements, and they should be monitorable and visible. Of course, all of these things, specifically things like monitorability and visibility, are really, really difficult in data systems because we bring the wrong mindset to how we set our data systems up. So that was a, a bit of an introduction. What I want to do is I actually want to present to you a couple of ideas for different SLOs, something that might be a little bit smarter. And we're going to start with the common one, which is availability. A lot of the people I talk to, a lot of my data stakeholders say, our data platform must be up 24-7, 100% of the time. Now, we're at P99Conf. You all know that 24-7, 100% isn't possible. Simple things like internet connectivity, power availability, um, you know, all sorts of things like that are going to cut away, cut into um, that SLO in a, in a practical sense. Um, so when we talk about availability, let's actually talk about what we mean when it, when it comes to data systems. So let's imagine that we have a daily sales report that we need to uh, compile. That report is compiled overnight through some analytics jobs that run in some sort of uh, data warehouse or some analytics uh, cluster. And we want that to be ready at the start of every business day because our data analysts are using it to help manage our sales and inventory management um, or our sales and inventory uh, processes, right? This job probably takes, I don't know, like three or four, maybe five hours to run every night. And, you know, pretty often there's a failure, like once a week, the numbers are wrong, the job has failed, something's fallen over. And so people are pretty frustrated and data engineers are frustrated because once a week they have to come in and fix something. And so obviously we're missing the point of availability because once a week we don't have the data in place. So clearly we're not at 100%, but maybe you say, okay, well, we'll say 99.9%, .9%. we'll say three nines of uptime. This is a pretty common approach, but it's actually meaningless. Um, I can give you good system availability in that analytics cluster if I just drop all of the data from the table and if I don't do anything, right? The system is actually fairly easy to operate. 99.9% uh, .9 is not that hard to get with just a, a system that just sits there. And it doesn't tell us anything about the actual value of the data. Um, the value is not from the system responding to queries. The, the value is from the system to responding 
to queries with the right information. We need to have the correct data. That's actually very important. Furthermore, we're paying for all of this availability for the system. You know, at 11 p.m. on a Saturday night, nobody's using it. Nobody's working on that. We, we, we don't really need to have this sort of massive availability if we don't have that built into our use case. So let's think about something a little bit better. So let's say that the daily report must be completed by 7 a.m. every day. This is a lot closer to actual user requirements. The problem is that this is a binary outcome. It doesn't give us a lot of wiggle room because the job is either done or not. It's either, either that the data is there and the report is generated by 7 a.m. or it's not. It doesn't tell us how to do better. It doesn't give us a, a good way to measure a meaningful distribution of how bad the SLO misses are. It's just a yes, no. It's more of a stick than a carrot for your engineering teams. It makes people say, you promised 7 a.m. every day and you didn't get it. We want to do better than that. So let's think about um, giving us a little bit of wiggle room. 7 a.m., 99% of the time. This is a bit better, but it's still just a composition of binary outcomes. We need to think about the window that we're measuring over. You know, is it 99% of 7 a.m. over 100 days, over a year, over a month? What does that mean? And it still doesn't actually give us any like better decomposability. It's still just binary, yes or no. And this 99% gives us wiggle room, but it doesn't actually improve our user value or our user experience. So this is what I really like doing. And this is actually an SLO I implemented at a client for a, pro a, a problem that was very similar to the one I'm describing here. We're going to start counting the number of minutes past 7 a.m. every workday when the job isn't successfully completed. And we're going to say that over any 30 working day window, so over any six calendar week period, we are not going to allow ourselves more than 270 minutes of, of miss. Now, this is great. I love this because this means that if you are just late by like five minutes, it's probably not a big deal if that happens once in a while. It gives us a wiggle room. It gives us an error budget. 270 minutes might be long enough to rerun the job if you wake up in the morning and it has failed. It gives us a way to think about how to improve our job. If our job takes more than 270 minutes to run because we're not using efficient queries or we're not partitioning our data or indexing our data in an efficient way, we can improve that. We can use this to guide our pipelines engineering processes to become more efficient. This is also very connected to user value. Minutes matter. If you need to have it ready by 7 a.m. in the morning, sorry, if you need to have it ready by 7 a.m., it's probably because somebody needs to work with it. And if you can tell them, I'm sorry, I need another 30 minutes today, the data will be ready. It was just a little bit late because of an issue. That's a lot more valuable to the user than just saying, sorry, it's not there. So if we rewrite this, if we look at this type of, of computation and we make some assumptions like the working day is between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., that's 720 minutes per day, if we say 30 working days, that's 21,600 minutes over those 30 working days. And if we're saying 270 minutes down are allowed over 21,600 minutes, that's saying that our SLO is 98.75% availability. That's a really good SLO. And that's, you know, it's not 99.9. .9. If you want to do the math for 99.9, .9, you certainly can. But this gives us something that we can actually think about in terms of uh, sort of conventional SLO theory, but it makes a lot more sense for us because it is user value oriented. So I don't have a lot of time in this talk. I'm going to zoom through six more SLOs for data systems. Now, what are those six SLOs? I've already talked about availability here in the middle. I like to measure along these dimensions, the freshness of the data, the timeliness of the data, the system latency, so the actual performance of the infrastructure, the impact of the data that it has, the accuracy of it, and the completeness of it. Now, you don't have to measure all of these. It's not a good idea to measure all seven of them, but these are ones that I have seen in my experience having a direct impact on the end user within our organizations, within our clients, where the actual data makes uh, has a lot of value to them. These are sort of the six data quality dimensions according to like data governance canon. The problem with these, some of them are fine, timeliness, completeness, accuracy, et cetera. Some of them are good, but some of them are actually just kind of meaningless. Um, validity, how do you measure validity in a meaningful and automatable way? That doesn't make a lot of sense. And consistency here doesn't mean the consistency that you're necessarily used to. 
accuracy. How do you measure accuracy in a, in a meaningful way? So I wanted to kind of put a twist on this, and that's why I came up with these uh, sort of more user-centric dimensions before. If you want to use these dimensions, I'm not going to stop you. They're a great place to start. And if you're not doing any data quality SLOs, start with these before you start um, sort of breaking the rules. Learn the rules before you break the rules. So I'm going to talk about freshness. Now, with freshness, um, we're talking about um, how recent that data is. Um, it does, it's not the same thing as timeliness. Timeliness means, you know, how relevant that data is near to the point where you actually need it. Freshness is about, um, you know, how frequently are you able to get it, right? So some data can't be fresher than, say, 15 days because you have to go through certain um, uh, validation processes or there might be other, other factors, right? So, for example, with some analytics software, um, you don't get your web analytics until up to 24 hours later because it's it's batched, right? So the freshest it can be would be 24, like 24 hours. Um, so in this case, uh, what we actually want to do is is something that looks similar to P99 latency, um, where you might want to actually think about the actual process, right? So if you can't get something better than 15 days in this example, then you want to actually measure your latency by the your P99 latency in this case by 15 plus n days or 15 days plus x hours um, so that you're actually driving that to uh, a faster response, but you're actually not worried about those 15 days where you have um, some sort of immovable process that you have to account for, right? So this is where you can actually do latency. A lot of people are doing this, but a lot of people are missing the fact that you actually have to think about the data and the context that it exists in. So add that buffer when you do freshness. The example here um, is around data quality SLO around, it's a data quality SLO built around a process and not a system. Um, we're not talking about system latency, we're talking about the process latency. Um, if there's 15 days that it takes to go through some, some manual check, and then you want the data to come sometime after that, um, we actually want to think about how we can make those systems move that data as quickly as possible once it's available. Right? We're not talking about building a much more powerful system so that your query is faster. We're talking about moving the pipelines faster. So this is actually a really important thing. The second thing is, it's not the data engineers who own the quality. Right? You, they can't invent data quality over, out of thin air. They're usually building pipelines. Data quality means pushing a lot of these requirements upwards. So if you want to reduce your freshness dimension, don't start, or I'm sorry, if you want to reduce your freshness SLO, don't start with your data engineers. Start with the process. Similar thing with timeliness. Timeliness is different than freshness. Timeliness is about how long it takes to use the data once it's ready. Um, so that's now that you have that data, it's 15 days um, since it was generated, we've gone through the process, now you want to be able to use the data as soon as possible. Um, here we can use something like P99 again, but you might want to have a different threshold. Um, again, you, we, we know how to measure this, we know how to instrument this, we know how to monitor this, the thing is that you have to actually build that into your pipelines and you have to separate um, the availability of the data to use from the availability of the data when it is when it is generated. If you try to conflate these things then you actually get a lot of um, uh, problems with who's responsible. For timeliness, this is where the data engineers are actually responsible because this is about how fast they can actually make that data available to you once they have it. Um, so I like to separate these things a little bit. Of course, we're talking about latency, so I'll talk about the third part of latency. This is the one that you know. Um, this is a system latency SLO. This is the one that a lot of analysts really feel pained by, because when they're running queries, they often complain about their queries being low, uh, a slow. The problem is that latency is really hard to measure when the data is vastly different. Um, sometimes queries are slow and you don't know why, and sometimes queries are slow because there's just a lot of data. And sometimes queries are slow because the system is trying to process too many queries at the same time. So what you actually need in order to measure this effectively is you need to create a baseline. So when you're doing a P99 latency for something like an analytics system or a dashboarding application, you need to be able to have reference um, jobs that you're measuring that against and you need to have different conditions that are based on the cluster size, that are based on indexing, that are based on locks and things like that that might affect how those jobs um, are running. And so you need to actually baseline this a little bit better before you start measuring your P99 latency, because if you don't, then you're gonna get a very wide distribution 
in that latency, and it's going to be really hard to use that in order to debug your system. Fourth one um, is impact. I like to talk about impact because um, a lot of times we are moving data without really thinking about why. Um, I talked to a lot of clients. I, I was just with a panel um, a couple weeks ago with a client, and he says, you know, we've got um, in the tens of thousands of employees, and we have in the tens of thousands of dashboards. We basically have one dashboard per employee. That's really not the most effective use of data because who knows what's going on in those dashboards? Who knows how that data is being used? So we, what we actually want to do is we want to measure how often our data is being used, and we want to measure how often that data is being updated. So the frequency of use as a ratio of the frequency to update is a great way to measure the effectiveness of a piece of data or a data set or a data product within the organization. You need to be able to justify the engineering spend for your data. So a good way to measure that is measuring how frequently it's used. I mentioned earlier that accuracy is difficult. Um, with BI, accuracy is uh, critical because you actually need high uh, accuracy if you're reporting to a regulator or for contractual purposes, you don't want to be wrong. Um, so here, uh, one of the things that's really difficult is how do you actually know if you're correct? Like how do you, it, you can't prove a system using that same system, right? You have to have some external validation for it. Um, otherwise you'd have a tautology. This error rate can be really hard to compute. One thing that you can do, however, is to use subsets and anomaly detection. You can look for statistically significant changes to upstream inputs that are likely to affect the KPI, right? So things like duplicate rows can, can seriously break your aggregations. If you can measure and monitor the number of rows that go into your aggregations and you see statistically significant changes in that, that might help improve um, your accuracy. And so you can build uh, things like a p-value using statistics to create an SLO around accuracy. Um, it's okay if, if you miss sometimes, it's okay if this is not perfect, but what you actually wanna do is use this to start driving better tests for this level of rigor, and one of the ways to do that, to do those tests is actually to use statistics to look for anomalies. Finally, accuracy with SLO for machine, or accuracy SLO with machine learning. Um, here, I don't actually have a good one, but what I do have are a bunch of bad ones. Stop using academic metrics. F1 means nothing in the real world. Area under the curve means nothing in the real world. These are academic metrics that we use to publish papers, but they have no correlation. There's no proven correlation between these metrics and real world monetary value. Stop shipping new machine learning algorithms just because it gives you a better score on a standardized test. Start measuring your machine learning models based on what impact they're having on your users. You need to come up with monitoring of how it's affecting user behavior, and you need to track those metrics. What those are, it's going to be very dependent on your system, but please stop using these as SLOs. And then last, completeness. Um, completeness, again, is very difficult because it's hard to say if something is missing. You can look for nulls, of course, but how do you know if all of your data is there? Um, one of the ways to do that is to, look, is to use sampling. Um, you can mock uh, complete data sets and incomplete data to look for um, incomplete data percentages to compute a KPI. Um, this is, again, it's not super reliable, but it does help you monitor those systems for, um, for where things might go wrong. So that is all that I have. I had to go through a lot of content in a very short period of time, so thank you for bearing with me and my very fast speaking. I will end with a couple of notes. The first is that not every SLO applies to every use case, and the ones that I presented are not gospel. Please don't use them just because I said them. Please think through them and think about how you can build a better SLO for the use cases that you have for your data systems, and think about the efforts that you put into monitoring and tracing and alerting and all of those things for your data systems. Finally, the six data quality dimensions, they're great. It's a great starting point. Um, but they are often disconnected from end user value. They're often impossible to track. So again, there, don't just do them for the sake of doing them. Think about your users, think about what value you're bringing to them, and that's it. So thank you very much. I'm happy to connect with you uh, about SLOs, about uh, data systems, and what we're doing. Thank you very much.